Kristaps Porzingis reportedly feels frustrated with his role in the Dallas offense and perhaps even his place in the franchise as a whole. Now, when Dallas acquired Kristaps Porzingis in 2018 from the New York Knicks, the expectation was that he, if he could not be option one, as he preferred, he could at least be option two, if not even 1A with Luka Doncic. That has simply not played out, unfortunately, as Porzingis spent the better part of his first season actually playing with the Mavericks, battling back from a year-long layoff in immense amounts of rust. We did see growth and improvement in his game, particularly with regard to rebounding. He was still an elite rim protector, and it set up well that if he could knock off that rust and find some of that unicorn magic, he would be a perfect co-star next to Doncic. Unfortunately, it never really had a chance to work out, at least not for an extended period of time. After Dwight Powell went down with his Achilles injury in January of last year, Porzingis moved to the starting center role, which he was initially resistant to, but saw tremendous success with. From January, when Porzingis moved to the five, until the restart with the bubble and until his meniscus tear against the Clippers in the first round last year, Porzingis was on an absolute tear. He was playing the best basketball of his career, particularly in the bubble during the eight-game bubble tournament, reseeding tournament, whatever you want to call it. He averaged 30 and 10 and was every bit the true superstar 1A option with Luka Doncic that he could have possibly envisioned being. The problem was the eventual torn meniscus against the Clippers. In that series, KP was strong. Now, he got suspended, or not suspended, he got ejected from game one late in the first half during a scuffle in which Marcus Morris took a shot at Luka and, and KP stood up for his teammate. And KP, unfortunately, had already picked up a technical for arguing a call, and so he was ejected from his first career playoff game. Game two, he was better. Much better. He played the whole game. Game three, he was sensational. 34-13 and 13 for KP in game three for Dallas of that series. And then we found out about the injured knee. We found out about the meniscus tear. He was immediately put behind the eight ball because even though it was not the same knee as the ACL, it was still a major setback in that it ended his season. It severely hamstrung Dallas and their potential to knock off the Clippers last year. And it put KP in yet another offseason of surgery and rehabilitation. To make matters worse, it was a highly condensed offseason because the NBA determined they were going to start in December to try to lined back up for the start of this next year with their usual 82-game season schedule that wraps up in June every year. So this was a highly shortened offseason, a highly condensed 72-game regular season, and KP was coming off an injury, and that did not bode well for him. He missed the first 10 games of the season, came back at a time when the team was in an absolute downfall due to health and safety protocols, missing at times six players because of those health and safety protocols. And it just put him in a corner where it felt like he never got physically right. He was not the bubble KP that we saw against the Clippers. He was not the same in terms of his speed, in terms of his agility, his verticality, his athleticism. He wasn't that KP. Instead, he was for a stretch of the season the worst defender in the NBA. And I again, I said the Mavericks didn't do him any favors with how they've utilized him in this year. I think that's equal as well on the defensive end. They did not make adjustments for a long time. Teams were attacking KP, forcing him into switches on the perimeter when he was clearly not up to that element of his game anymore, at least for the time being. He got better as the season wore on, but for a while it was brutal, and Dallas just was not making adjustments to take him out of those situations. So he got all kinds of heat and slander in terms of national perception and everything like that this year. His offensive game took a while to come back. Yes, there were flashes. Hell, his first game of the season, he looked damn good. We saw flashes of bubble KP in the offensive game, 
but we didn't see any consistency at all. Despite that, he did post a 2010 stat line with some of his best shooting marks of his career in terms of the efficiency. However, push came to shove. You had a rematch with the Clippers, and KP, who was expected to be the difference maker, the thing Dallas lacked the year before, suddenly was gone. Suddenly he was, other than game two, where he had 20 points on 8 of 12 shooting, a few, three steals, I think, and a block. Other than that one game, he spent the vast majority of the series camped out in the corner as a decoy. At his word, at Carlisle's word, he was a decoy. He was getting six shots a game. He was a seven foot three spot up shooter who was limited in his impact. Even if he was giving effort and trying on the defensive end, the fact that he was getting eight, nine, ten points in a game was absolutely tanking any any perception of him being that number two guy next to Luca, And the result was Luca had to do everything. Luca had to average 37 points per game. He had to score on assist on damn near every Dallas basket. And it put him into a corner where you were hitting the fourth quarter. Game after game, you would hit the fourth quarter and Luca would be spent. Suddenly, Luca's sensational play drops off a cliff because suddenly he's shooting 31, 32% in the fourth quarter. He's scoring in many cases... Single digits, one, four, six points in the fourth quarter because he's out of gas. And that should have been Porzingis' time. If you weren't utilizing him before, if you were using him as a decoy before, when you were hitting that wall in the fourth quarter, and especially in games six and seven, when your season was slipping away, you should have been going to Porzingis. You should have been setting him up and saying, hey, if we're not running outright plays for him, we at least need to make a conscious effort to get him in his spots. Get him somewhere in that mid-range game, somewhere down around the paint. He has no low post game to speak of right now, but you still know where his strengths are. Get him in those spaces. Let him do a little bit of something, something. Instead, they just kind of left him there. And the Clippers basically said, you know what? We see that it doesn't matter who we put on Luka. He's going to show out. He's going to get his points. But we're not going to let Porzingis beat us. So even if Luka had the ball and drove directly at Porzingis' man, he stayed glued to KP in the corner. Almost always. The, the big shot KP hit in Game 5, which was, as Carlisle put it after the game, the biggest shot for the Mavericks all season, that was a rare breakdown where LA, for some reason told Batum, who was in perfect defensive position, one pass away, playing strong side, told him to come creep up and help on Luka. And by him doing that, he created the passing lane for that quick release KP3. That's just bad coaching. That's a bad read of the situation by the Clippers. So good on KP knocking down that shot. But at the same time, it wasn't anything Dallas did. It was Luka seeing a wide open man because of bad defense and hitting him in that moment because, hey, I got two guys on me with another guy coming to shadow me. Obviously, I'm not going to have it. Kick it to the open guy, see what he does. They should have been going to KP in those games, and the fact that they weren't, the fact that he was getting six and seven shots per game, says that even though KP was saying all the right things in the post game, even though he was being professional and mature about all this, and he even talked at one point after game five about his growth and maturity, I think he understands that if he looks belligerent right now, he only lowers his stock further. And all of this culminates in a game where even though KP was good defensively in games six and seven, and he was moving without the ball and he had energy, cutting to the basket, finishing strong with dunks, he had his second best game of the series in game seven. It just didn't matter because he still wasn't getting the kind of looks he should have been getting. And so ultimately... It's a missed opportunity. You lose in the first round yet again. And KP is now expressing frustration. ESPN's Tim McMahon with the full quote here. Quote, Porzingis has been frustrated, oftentimes feeling like an afterthought than a co-star as Doncic dominates the ball and the spotlight. Unquote. I don't blame KP for this. Not, not for this comment, not for this frustration. It's clear this arrangement is not working out. 
everything he was told he would be has not played out that way. And blame for that goes everywhere. It goes, even though you don't want to blame a guy who just can't stay healthy because it's not like it's his choice not to stay healthy. KP's health has been a big factor in this, obviously. He missed a lot of time this year, missed a lot of time last year. Even when the Mavericks seemed like they were being overly cautious with him, it seemed like when they would roll him out there, he would still get hurt. And so then he'd have to legitimately miss time. And it wasn't just a matter of reducing his workload. That was a recipe for disaster. Whether it's that, whether it's Luka not implementing him and integrating him enough into the offense and utilizing him, whether it was Rick Carlisle simply not implementing him in the offense and getting him, getting him involved in the same way that Steven Silas did last year. All of that is fair. All of that deserves criticism. Silas left to go to Houston, and the Mavs' offense as a whole did not look nearly the same this year. Last year's offense was the most efficient in NBA history, and he got the most out of KP as a Maverick. Without him this year, KP never looked right. How much of that is Silas versus the condensed season and KP's health and never being fully right? That's debatable. Because when you're talking about these uber elite all-world talents, the difference between an all-world, one of the best in, in the league, the difference between that and a borderline role player is so incredibly slight. A missed half step of speed is the difference between the all-world player and the guy who's just a body on the court. And that's what KP was by the end of the season. And that's, that's a shame. I, whether How much of that was just his own regression in his abilities, whether that's a permanent regression, whether that was just the case of this year, we'll see. But it, it was a huge, huge loss for the Mavericks. KP did not play up to that role, and it seemed like they had lost all confidence in him by the end. Even though Carlisle would say the right things in the postgame of Game 5, he immediately started out by giving praise to KP and that shot. And, you know, that deserves credit, but at the same time, it didn't play out. It, it rang hollow because you said the right things, but you didn't do the right things unless you're insisting you didn't have just little faith in him compared to last year. There was a step back in that regard, and uh, it hurt KP's value. Now, what happens here? Well, this arrangement seems like it can only be headed for divorce, frankly, it's in KP's best interest to go elsewhere. It's in Dallas's best interest for KP to go elsewhere. The problem is his value is about as low as it's ever been this year. It's not as low as it was when he was the worst defender in the league this year, but it's pretty damn low. And the return you would get for him would be a bag of beans at this point. But you also have to realize that there's going to be other teams looking to make moves. Boston is going to go through a transformation here very soon. Now that Danny Ainge stepped down and Brad Stevens moved into that front office role with uh, the president of basketball operations, I think is his new title. So he's going to be reshaping that team. Dallas's last big fish they went after was Kimba Walker. Now, I think Kimba is very questionably done at this point. I think there's legitimate question as to whether or not he's got much left. But Dallas did go all out for him, and they did think, sincerely think, that they were going to land him before Boston swung a deal to get rid of Al Horford, which, by the way, is another guy talked about as a, as a viable Porzingis swap. But both trades involving OKC, by the way, that I've mentioned here. But if you look at that move, you might say, well, if Josh Richardson, coming off his own disappointing bad year, opts into his player option, as he's probably going to do, Dallas could probably pair Richardson and KP in exchange for Marcus Smart, who I think is a brilliant addition, and a local guy here from Flower Mound, and probably Kimba. Now, I'm not saying that excites me a ton. I'm not saying that moves the needle, necessarily. But it is an option you can make work from a salary cap perspective. More ambitious ideas are Carl Anthony Towns. I don't think you could swing that deal anyway, but the Timberwolves are going nowhere. So who the hell knows? Maybe they can be fooled into that. But Carl Anthony Towns, essentially, despite him having no defense, as far as offense is concerned... He is, even though KP was given the nickname the Unicorn by Kevin Durant when he was a rookie, Carl Anthony Towns is the realization offensively of everything we were told KP was going to be. 
So maybe there's something interesting there. I think more likely you're looking at something like an Al Horford deal, and that's Horford's a nice player. He had a nice year last year, but it's not it's not a tremendous addition at this point. Maybe it makes you better, and it's an expiring contract, which makes it better in that regard. You don't have to worry as much about you know three more years of KP on this current deal. But I think more than likely, and by the way, if there was a team that could recoup Porzingis's value and then flip him a year later or something, it would probably be the Oklahoma City Thunder with the way they're flipping players these years. Uh, Paul George, huge return, uh, embarrassingly good return for them uh, in that regard with the Clippers. Flipped Russell Westbrook when that was believed to be an untradeable contract. Flipped uh, Chris Paul, which I know Phoenix now is in their position, which looks great. But point being, they are kind of the, uh, the, the stop point the rest stop, if you will, where guys recoup value and then move on and the Thunder pick up more draft picks. But I don't know what's going to happen for KP. It is his first offseason in three years without, as we know it right now, an offseason surgery and rehabilitation. That's huge. If If he's going to salvage any sense of superstardom he might have had or his tremendous potential for his career, it has to start this next season he he has to be even if he's not bubble kp he has to be the kp we saw around january to march last year prior to the season suspending because of covid19 if he can do that then we have a real real shot at i mean when i say we i'm not even talking about the mavericks they i think the mavericks will aggressively look to shop him i think the question is going to be whether they like what they get in return for him and maybe the Horford deal works because you make it work money wise now while getting an expiring contract that gives you moving forward the kind of flexibility you need to build around Luka Doncic but it's it's an admission of misevaluation and failure and the reason I say failure is because the implementation it's an admission if they do it you know, we'll see what they do. They have to do something because the entire roster has to be evaluated here. The only guy that's untouchable is Luka Doncic. They tell us after Mark Cuban told, I think it was also ESPN's Tim McMahon and uh, Mac Ingle, I think of the Fort Worth star telegram told him after the game that Rick's not going anywhere. He said, quote, the grass is very, very, very rarely greener on the other side. I don't know if I would agree with that, but this doesn't sound like the usual like vote of confidence ownership will give a coach before then like a week later firing them anyway. I think more than likely Rick Carlisle is here to stay. Donnie Nelson's not going to go anywhere. Rick, uh, Mark Cuban obviously is not going to go anywhere. So the brain trust remains intact. And now it's just a matter of player evaluation. That's what this is going to boil down to. And we'll have to see what they end up doing. They'll probably aggressively look to move KP. Maybe they find something that works and fits well for them. Maybe they won't. But regardless, it's a, it's a turning point for the franchise because you had what you thought was going to be your co-star for the next five, ten years. And instead, you're finding yourself two full seasons into the experiment realizing this has failed miserably. And everybody shares blame in it. So we'll see what ends up happening with this. Regardless, it's, I think, a reasonable chance at this point that Kristaps Porzingis has played his final game as a Dallas Maverick. And that is probably the best for all parties involved. From Prospect to 